Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. If you're hearing this, then you're on the public feed, which means you'll get episodes a week after they come out and you'll hear advertisements. You can get access to the subscriber feed by going to colemanhughes.org and becoming a supporter. This means you'll have access to episodes a week early, you'll never hear ads, and you'll get access to bonus Q&A episodes. You can also support me by liking and subscribing on YouTube and sharing the show with friends and family. As always, thank you so much for your support. Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. My guest today is Renee DeResta. Renee is the technical research manager at the Stanford Internet Observatory. She led a multi-year investigation into the IRA, Russia's fake news factory, and she's advised Congress. She's also an ideas contributor at Wired and The Atlantic. We talk about the difference between misinformation, disinformation, and propaganda. We talk about public health messaging. We talk about hashtags and trending topics and the effect they can have on the real world. We talk about the increasing power of influencers and independent content creators like myself. We talk about censorship and algorithms on big tech platforms like Twitter and Facebook. We talk about Wikipedia as a source of accurate knowledge. We talk about how you should do research on topics you care about in a context where you can't always trust mainstream sources. We talk about how to avoid audience capture as a content creator. And we talk about whether math is racist. So without further ado, Renee DeResta. All right, Renee DeResta, thanks so much for coming on my show. Thanks for having me. So uh, it's it's been a couple of years since I met you, I think, uh, definitely from before the pandemic. But uh, I've, I've always been really, really impressed by uh, your analysis of the issues of misinformation and disinformation and uh, how propaganda spreads on social media. Um, and, and so before we get into all of that, can you just give my audience a little sense of who you are, how you came to care so much about these issues? Yeah, so um, my name is Renee, and I, um, I'm the research manager at the Stanford Internet Observatory. That's my current job. Um, I, you know, at, at the center, we study abuse of current information technologies. So there's a lot of um, a lot of fascinating work being done in tech, not a lot of adversarial thinking about how tech is going to be abused or misused. And I think that as we've all experienced the increasing power of the internet in our daily lives, there's a recognition that sometimes kind of inadvertent decisions or small decisions that are made relatively carelessly or because of a particular financial or business incentive um, really come to have pretty profound downstream effects. And so one of the things that we're trying to do uh, at SIO is think about what are the ways in which a system can be manipulated or abused. So almost like cybersecurity thinking, uh, but applied to the social web. So we look at trust and safety. We look at information integrity, like mis and disinformation. We look at emerging technologies. And then we try to think based on the um, kind of empirical analysis, what are the policy implications uh, for this? What are the norms that we see forming uh, in this particular communication infrastructure? What are the regulatory approaches, either self-regulatory or government regulatory that uh, might kind of um, impact the system? Where, where are the levers to create a better internet? And that's the, that's the kind of stuff that I, uh, that I focus on. Yeah, so uh, you wrote an Atlantic article recently where you made distinctions, and I think you've done this elsewhere too, uh, between propaganda and misinformation. And you, you've also made distinctions between misinformation and disinformation. And so I guess before we talk about any one of these, can you just tell us why you're, why, why you're cleaving those concepts and uh, what, what, uh, what those mean? So I think starting in around 2015, 2016, um, people began to get very interested in the idea of fake news, right? There was a, a growing sense. You remember, remember uh, Facebook had that trending topics feature and just wild things would go viral there all the time, just these blatantly false claims. And so we had this brief moment where fake news referred to actually demonstrably fake content before that term became really politicized. And the idea of misinformation was that there was some sort of demonstrably falsifiable claim. Um, the earth is flat, right? You know, or vaccines cause autism. Things where there is such an overwhelming body of evidence that there is a factual counter to a claim. So that's where we had this idea of misinformation. 
disinformation, that conversation started when in 2017, there began to be kind of an abundance of evidence of state actors using social media to try to manipulate the public. Um, the most kind of widely studied um, example of this was the Internet Research Agency and its activities targeting American citizens, but it was happening all over. And that was this question of disinformation, which is a term from the Soviet Union um, that referred to the deliberate intent to influence and intent to deceive. So the distinction between the miss and the dis was really in this idea of intent. The problem is it's very, very hard to ascertain intent. It's maybe one thing when you have a nice, neat dividing line like a state actor, right? The carrying on a kind of um, influence operations dynamic that has been going on in great power conflicts for you know decades. Um, but this idea of disinformation and misinformation uh, again, there were there were very specific kind of narrow uses of the term, but as people began to feel more and more like um, their experience of the internet was encountering things that were false, but oftentimes it wasn't a falsifiable claim, it was something that they disagreed with, and so that those terms got very muddy. And I, I felt that propaganda was actually really the best descriptor of what we were all concerned about experiencing, this idea of information with an agenda and information inflected for you know particularly inflammatory point of view but not necessarily falsifiable often in times not falsifiable at all and yet not disinformation not necessarily with an intent to deceive but more with an intent to persuade people towards a particular point of view and we've had this yes yeah, this idea of persuasion and propaganda in our information environment dating back to the uh, you know the kind of pamphleteering wars uh, following the advent of the printing press and so I, I felt that what we were experiencing was much more a modern manifestation of propaganda, uh, but distinctly different from our old kind of academic definition of the term, uh, which had come to include this idea that it was a top down manipulation of the people by the government. Um, in the you know in prior communication environments, only the powerful had access to the means of disseminating a message, right? And so propaganda was seen as this top down, the manufacture of consent of the population. Whereas what we now have on social media is this bottom up dynamic where anyone has access to those tools. Anyone can create and spread a message. Anyone can persuade the public toward their point of view, um, including by using things that are misleading, inflammatory, false. You know, There's a variety of different manifestations, but ultimately I felt that we had moved into an environment where it was that that notion of uh, persuasion and uh, polemicism, <laughs> but not falsifiable and not necessarily with an element of deception. So I, I started to feel like the conversation was just, um, we were trying to shoehorn too much stuff into uh, too narrow of terms. Yeah, so the, the word propaganda, I think uh, some people have a sense that propaganda means it's false or means that it's a nefarious and they think of they think of nazis basically when they hear the word pr propaganda um but the the way you're using it is is more in the original sense of the word where it's not necessary it doesn't necessarily have a negative connotation right right there's an interesting history there and i don't want to be like bore you with a history lesson but um Propaganda means to propagate. It's a it's a particular construction of um, of the Latin verb, and Pope Gregory used it um, following the uh, you know during during the Reformation, right? So there was this sense that the Protestants were winning the messaging war, right? And this is again during the age of pamphlets and the printing press is expanding people's access to information. And the Pope says um, he forms a committee, the Sacred Committee for the Propagation of the Faith. And propagare, it means to propagate. So it is actually just a, it is a description of a verb, right? It, it's now kind of thought of as like the substance of the content, um, but it really meant this exhortation, you must spread the one true faith. And there was like a command that went along with it. It was a very forceful term. And it was saying, you are going to go out and 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 re, you know, <laughs> bring, the, the, bring the lost sheep back to the fold. Um, over time, particularly as wars begin to happen and in the age of mass media, where people who control the, uh, the broadcast channels um, can, prop, you know, can propagate certain information to the public, what you start to see is 
this idea of, um, as you noted, it wasn't originally a pejorative, um, propaganda as information with an agenda, but there's this interesting period in the 1920s where there is a sincere belief among uh, particular, you know, the kind of governing class that it is actually the responsibility of the government to synthesize information for people because they can't possibly synthesize it on their own. There's just too much stuff for them to pay attention to. And so this is an interesting theory, right? This idea that in order to have uh, democratic cohesion and an informed public, the government has to do something to message to the public. Over time, of course, we start to see the blatant manipulation of that trust. You know, we see the Vietnam War, we see the Gulf War, we see instances in which the government lies to the people. And then you have the kind of Chomsky era um, definition of propaganda as this top-down construct where media and government kind of collude to put forth false messages or misleading messages um, to an unwitting public. And that's how this term gradually evolves from being something that, you know, this, this exhortation, you must propagate this message to a very particular top-down construct. I think actually in some ways that old definition is really relevant today because we're all sitting here trying to propagate messages. And as we look at social media in particular, where you have information cascades and things hopping from one, one network to another, people serving as the conduits, um, it really is back to this idea of propagation. Sorry, my cat is old and <laughs> not the most uh, dexterous at this point. The first time the tail entered the frame, it just looked like you had a tail. I'm, I'm not going to lie. But then now we see the whole I, cat. I swear there's a cat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's interesting. I mean, the, the one. So that notion you said from the 1920s of, of governments believing they had a kind of paternalistic um, uh, mandate to tell people things and because there's too much information out there. I mean, to some extent, that's sort of true of public health messaging. I mean, I, I've been reading the articles about Omicron from the Atlantic, uh, and there was one where they tried to get the CDC, like the, the writers trying to get the CDC to give a clear sort of a guideline for how long you should uh, self-quarantine if right now, if you if you find out that, that you have COVID. And... The, the guidelines were just sort of a paragraph of hodgepodge information and and uncertainty, some of which just reflected a genuine a genuine uncertainty. But the idea that that's the message to the public, it's it just, you know, it, it was hard for me to consume as someone that was reading the article with 100% of my attention. Um, and, and it would be therefore that much harder for people to get the message if, if they're sort of passively consuming info as, as people often do. Um, so I don't know, I, I guess there's under one definition of propaganda, there's probably the CDC needs to have better propaganda. Um, but yeah, in, in any event, you, you talk about in, in your Atlantic article, this sort of case study of a hashtag that was manufactured by, um, uh, someone trying to unseat Nancy Pelosi. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about this case study and why it's interesting to you? Yeah, so it was um, it was during the primaries um, or shortly after the primaries, the way it works in California, it's the two top challengers continue on. So in this case, it was a socialist, a democratic socialist by the name of Shahid Batar and then Pelosi, the incumbent. And so, so I happened to watch this play out. Um, I, I didn't talk to Shahid until until I wrote that article actually. So I, I had just this, my perception of it as a person observing it on the screen. So the hashtag was Pelosi must go. And um, his supporters had thrown into this discord that I happened to be in this exhortation. We are going to get this trending at noon on Sunday. And I thought, okay, well, let's see if they can do it. You know, that's interesting. Um, there's some interesting questions there, right? This, this, uh, what is, um, what is, how should we think about whether a hashtag is manufactured or, you know, the spontaneous outpouring, when does coordination veer into something that we would consider manufacturing versus is it the norm on social media today for candidates who want to get attention to do this? And so he puts in this request on, you know, at noon on Sunday, we are going to do this. And they got it done. And that, that was something that was really interesting to me. So that it originally started off with uh, the sort of left, the democratic socialist folks tweeting about how Pelosi had to go, uh, arguing against her from the left, um, nepotism and you know uh, incompetence and um, Medicare for all and all of the kind of policy things that they wanna see, but they're using this hashtag. 
And in an interesting way, that hashtag is a bit of a Rorschach test. Anybody can look at it and can read their own particular political affinity into it because they're saying she must go not, it's not a positive statement about Medicare for all. It's not a positive statement about a socialist party plank. Instead, it's the incumbent sucks. We need to get rid of the incumbent particularly given that it's Pelosi, who's, you know, the Speaker of the House and a quite a prominent figure in conservative, um, you know, kind of firebrand politics as well. So what you what you see happen in this moment is it starts to climb the trending charts because the left is talking about it. And then it's picked up by the Republican challenger in this race who was out at this point. Um, but she was kind of a QAnon uh, figure, kind of the extreme sort of um, populist fringy, right? And so she comes in and then all of a sudden these QAnon people come into the hashtag. And then you start to see conservative influencers again, uh, more on the sort of, um, more on the, I'm trying to think of uh, the way to put this, the sort of firebrand types um, who just sort of amplify it with this, yeah, Pelosi must go. And they don't add a whole lot to it. Again, there's no Pelosi must go because of reason X, Y, Z. It just turns into sort of a, a mutual uh, hate Pelosi fest. And this is fine, you know, these are perfectly valid political opinions, um, but it's that it hits the conservative uh, kind of centers of Twitter. And then all of a sudden you have something that originated over here on the left that really completely transforms as QAnon picks it up and starts to make allegations of her and child trafficking and a range of other things. Uh, and then the sort of this other community picks it up. And so you see this hashtag really bounce around and get amplified and it does hit number two, number three on Twitter trends uh, relatively quickly within about 45 minutes. And so it was interesting to me to see this, um, this remarkable progression of this kind of ping-ponging back and forth of, again, a completely legitimate political sentiment, uh, but the ways in which it rose to national attention. And then of course, once it is trending, once it is up on that chart, other people come in who are not necessarily picking it up from one of these uh, sort of smaller, more niche activist communities. And you start to see mainstream figures uh, begin to weigh in on this also. The sort of Pelosi's fans come in and, and try to transform the hashtag into a pro-Pelosi hashtag. Pelosi must go straight to the White House. And so it's this, um, this interesting dynamic of how do, we, how do messages reach our attention today? You don't necessarily know. Most of the people observing that hashtag had no idea how it originated or how it made it to the top of trends or that sort of three distinct unique factions kind of picked it up and bounced it around with their own take. They just sort of see it when it hits trending. And that's what captures mainstream attention because once it's trending, it's a thing that we all pay attention to if we have our phones out and, you know, and it's in the top five. Um, and it becomes kind of an interesting question of, how do you know how do things we talk about like manufacturing consent and the you know kind of collusion and people putting forth messages it's interesting how much of it just comes from these groundswells where pivotal influencers with large followings retweet a message to their fans that hits trending and that captures our attention and then we talk about that and then the media covers that and so it's this bottom up dynamic that's really distinctly different than anything we've ever had before in history and that's what i find so fascinating yeah, I think there are a lot of frameworks that originally made sense uh, in the context of governments that are are now that now only make sense in the context of 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 big tech. So this is obviously one, uh, and you you coined the term ampliganda in this uh, in this article, where you're saying you know as what people used to worry about is the government being able to start some kind of slogan or little piece of language or propaganda uh, that would then go everywhere and, and be as persuasive as it was. But now what we're worried about is these bottom up, you know, influencers, pr probably someone like myself would count as, as in that broad category who can potentially do that kind of thing. And it's, it's still propaganda and can be as harmful or helpful as government propaganda could be, but it's not coming from the top and you can't hold it accountable in, in the same way, uh, in, in the same democratic way. And I guess an, another one of these frameworks that has moved, I think, from government to big tech is, is the worry of censorship, which is, you know, no one is really worried about no Republican is worried really about Biden or the Biden administration censoring them or their local, uh, you know, their, their, st their state administration censoring them. You're worried about Twitter censoring you or 
um, you know, or, or Facebook or Twitter down regulating your posts or something like that. And uh, this is something I want to talk to you about because I, you know, I sometimes get messages from, from my followers saying, I think you're being shadow banned. I think your posts are being down regulated. I haven't been seeing your tweets. And I don't know to what extent that is paranoia. Um, I know certainly some of it must be paranoia, um, but quite possibly a lot of it is true. And, uh, you know, just the other day, I think it was three days ago, there was a Daily Mail story about how the Scotland police are, as a policy, are now allowing suspected male rapists to identify as female. In, in other words, people uh, born male that have been arrested or convicted of raping a woman uh, to identify as female. So, okay. So this is a, a classic culture war clickbait article. Moreover, JK Rowling is on the, on the thumbnail. She's commented on this uh, saying this is Orwellian. Okay. Without getting into the, the actual, that actual topic, um, six hours after this was posted on Daily Mail, which has over half a million followers, it has only six likes and, and like 10 retweets. And the reason I came across this is because the JK Rowling hashtag was recommended to me, right? So it's, it's JK Rowling is, is trending. Twitter knows that I, I'm a sucker for a good JK Rowling controversy. <laughs> um, so I click on it. And this is one of the first posts that comes up. So clearly it's recommended to me, but I see it was posted six hours ago and has an, an unbelievably low amount of traction, right? Like I could, with, with a third of the followers, I could get 10 likes in 30 seconds on, on something far less interesting. So, um, so how close attention have you been paying to the, you know, the problems of censorship or, or diet censorship and down regulation. Uh, what do you make of all this? Yeah, I, I think you, I mean, you raised some really interesting points there. I actually saw that story too. And I'm trying to remember um, how it hit my radar. I follow a pretty politically diverse set of people. And, and so I, um, I don't know what the algorithm thinks I am at this point, but, um, but you, you're, you make a couple points there. First, I do think that the accounts for the media properties themselves often seem to have far lower engagement than the influencers who talk about the same thing. And I've often wondered why that is. I want to be totally clear that one of the challenges we have when we try to understand these dynamics is that we're not getting, we, we can ingest tweets is what it's called. You know, we can use the API and we can pull in public data and we can look at the substance that is put out into the world. But what we can't see is anything related to what you're asking as far as what is shadow banned, what is flagged, uh, what is deprecated in some sense. This has some interesting challenges, which is sometimes it looks like something is overrepresented. Um, we just did a study of uh, some Chinese linked accounts. There are still tons of state actors playing in this game. Um, tweeting about uh, Xinjiang and cotton, right? And the idea that the Uyghurs are um, living these blissful lives and they're just constantly, constantly, constantly putting this stuff out there. And it doesn't actually surface. It does not hit the radar. And we don't know if that's because it's been throttled in some way because there is such a high prevalence of low quality accounts putting out the content. We can't see any of that. Um, other times people assume that it must be having impact simply because the tweets exist or we treat engagement as a proxy for influence or impact, when in reality, we also see accounts where it has almost no followers, but tens of thousands of likes, and then that looks more like there's some sort of click farm coming in. So this, it's really hard, I think, to make any kind of um, reasonable systematic assessments of the dynamics that you're talking about, because we just don't have visibility. And that, I think, is one of the key challenges with understanding the information environment we're in. Everybody feels that they're shadow banned. That's a really interesting phenomenon. Conservatives feel it, liberals feel it, um, all different types of uh, kind of identity or civil society based groups feel it. And it's, you know, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon per your point about, is it paranoia? As far as like the censorship versus censorship light, this is actually the, the question that I think is really interesting is the idea of, is there a way 
to create some transparency around the structures that lead things to be surface that is independent from the substance, if that makes sense. So rather than talking about this theme, that hashtag, this thing, that uh, that political point of view, is it possible for us to gain some better visibility or potentially even redesign, giving users much more control of the sorts of factors that feed the algorithms that curate content for us. There is always a waiting function there, right? Short of, if you turn your feed to reverse chronological, the problem should be solved. You should see you know, the things from the people that you follow in reverse chronological order. But most people don't actually want to do that because they want to see the good stuff, right? They want to see the stuff that's engaging that people are talking about. And so the curation there is looking at things like what is getting engagement. When I talked to Shahid about his hashtag, one thing that he said to me that was really interesting was that nobody engaged with his policy tweets that they would just go by and, and per your point he was like nobody ever sees them nobody ever engages with them nobody likes them i have this many followers but nobody reacts to it um, but when i put out something fiery when i add that moral righteousness that indignation that that kind of um that people then pick up and amplify because they're like yes i am right there with you that goes viral and so in an interesting way, I think we have this question of um, what are the inputs that go into that curation that make your followers or some of your followers see or not see your stuff. Um, we don't have any understanding of that. And I think at this point, the better conversation to have as we think through how do we, what do we want the social media environment to look like is actually questions just like that. Do we want to have much more granularity for user control so that people can make sure that they see the accounts or people that they want to see if only to mitigate the allegations that some sort of mass censorship regime is happening, might that be a way forward towards like, you know, creating a, a perception of, um, you know, good faith and of tech companies as, uh, as, as not being like out to get you. Yeah. Is there, is there like a model of a tech company that you think is doing it right or doing it right relative to others that, uh, that you think can be replicated or something like that? I think Twitter research is a really interesting thing. I mean, they're doing research internally and putting it out. Um, not, I, I mean, I'd like to see more, but again, it's sort of the early, you know, the kind of early days of them of them creating that transparency. Um, I think Reddit is also interesting in this regard. You know, it has a kind of over layer of moderation, but then a lot of it is the culture established by the mods in the in the subreddits, right? Um, I think this is not a social network, but I've been really intrigued by Wikipedia's model. And you mentioned um, your, you know, your reading of the CDC kind of um, inadequate communication on, on Omicron, and I'm very sympathetic to that. I, I feel like we're in an interesting environment where we're all looking for information, and sometimes when you just search for a term, what's going to surface is the thing that's been most engaged with, which is not always the most accurate thing. Often it's just the most um, you know, outrageous thing or the thing that the algorithm rewarded and you know, it got a lot of likes. Um, I, I think Wikipedia is interesting in that there's like an edit history, there's a version control, if you will, you can see a conversation and a debate about how a sentence was added or removed, particularly for controversial topics. It's not perfect, but it at least gives people a sense that um, they can see the debate at work around how the, you know, consensus was formed in a particular, you know, for a particular understanding of a topic or an understanding of a situation, particularly if it's a thing that's really rapidly evolving. So I think there's, you know, there's kind of two things here. One, how do we decide what should be popular? What should be curated up? Is that a thing that we want centralized within tech companies? Do they decide or do we want users given the power to do those rankings for themselves? So that's one thing. And then the other thing is on this question of consensus and ranking in, you know, and, and arriving at a shared truth. And that's where I think that Wikipedia model perhaps um, creates a you know a a sense that the situation is evolving the world is changing but here is our best understanding of a thing at a time yeah i think um you know one of my least favorite tropes of well public and private education uh, you know of my era was teachers telling you you should never use wikipedia because they were probably right if, you know, we probably shouldn't use it to cite, but they were given the impression that Wikipedia is is far less accurate than Britannica, um, and and just in general is a, a a bunk resource, which is I think I think really does it a disservice. I mean, I've seen 
they would always tell us to use these encyclopedias like Britannica, which, you know, I, I found just typo, like glaring typos in, in Britannica articles and, and, and horrible things like that. But Wikipedia, I mean, it, it can be hit or miss, but the fact that it is collaborative and adversarial in terms of you, you have editors with opposite politics, uh, you know, editing the same article, it really does, you know, uh, it, it, the end result can end up being better than almost anything else that that's competing with it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about about the, the most consequential, I think, right now place where propaganda is playing a role and social media filter echo chambers and, and so forth, which is anti-vax propaganda. Um, I know this is something something you're you're paying attention to. And I've had doctors on my podcast and I, I've tried to do my very best to take seriously and steel man the concerns of people that have have not got vaccinated and and don't want to get vaccinated um but what what can you tell me what are you noticing about the anti-vax propaganda space as it manifests on social media that's a that's a great question um i i have a hard time answering it without <laughs> again going into some long ass history but the anti-vaccine movement again, when we talk about things that are very, very old, it, it began in the age of smallpox, right? And uh, it began when people were very concerned at the time that, you know, taking smallpox variolation, they would take cowpox and, you know, they would kind of like um, make a you know, little mark and uh, kind of rub it on you. It was kind of gross. Um, there was this idea that you would like turn into a human cow hybrid or you know, there were all sorts of crazy rumors. Again, this is the 1800s. Um, and one thing that I found as I've looked into the dynamics around anti-vaccine activism then is that there were these canonical themes that have resonated with us through history. Um, the idea of safety, right? Are we making a decision that keeps us safe? Are we, are we able to adequately understand the risks? Um, themes about toxicity, again, this idea that the, the cow pus basically would uh, turn you into a cow or was, would be toxic for you is echoed in modern anti-vaccine dynamics around concerns about ingredients in vaccines or now the mRNA vaccine. Is it toxic? And if so, how? Um, religiosity is a big one, right? Are, are you, um, how should you think about injecting yourself with a, a foreign substance? There's some uh, religions that have opinions on that. Um, and so these ideas, these, these claims, and then conspiracy, right? Ideas that a man behind the curtain is, is trying to make you do this thing or world governments are trying to control you and the, the much more kind of um, tropey theories that, don't, you know, that, that insinuate that the pandemic is caused by someone who is going to benefit in some way from hurting you. All of that stuff is very, very, very old. But those themes resonate because when we talk about propaganda, you know, you noted um, this idea of, of true versus false. There's always a grain of truth because the, it, that's what clicks with people. There's always a familiarity there. Oh, I've heard this before. Oh, I saw this in a movie. Um, we call them tropes because it's a kind of a building block of a narrative, something that the audience really resonates with. And they persist over time because they appeal to us on a very emotional level. And so this idea of anti-vaccine propaganda dates back, you know, you know, um, <laughs> like over 100 years. And, and so how do we think about that in the age of social media, right? And that's where there were some things that happened on tech platforms structurally in 2014, 2015 that really were profoundly impactful. So there was this man named Andrew Wakefield who wrote a paper that was retracted um, and it alleged that vaccines caused autism. And this created a phenomenal amount of fear. Again, this idea of safety. Am I, am I hurting my child by giving them an MMR vaccine? So it, it created these, these communities of parents who were very, very concerned about this particular um, claim that he had made. And even after the paper was retracted, parents who had had this first person experience of having a child be diagnosed with autism um, really persisted in their belief. There was nothing else that was given to them as an explanation for a cause. So they were in some ways receptive to the idea that the government was covering it up. Or again, this man behind the curtain was trying to, uh, to make sure that the truth did not come out. 
And so you had this new experience in which conspiracy theories and uh, discredited uh, science were there, but had been really deeply internalized by people who were extremely passionate and really evangelizing and wanting to tell the world uh, that this was the way of things. And so they were very um, actively trying to reach the public. Media stopped covering them because media no longer wanted to amplify the false claim that vaccines cause autism. So media kind of stopped covering that. Um, and what happened though was social media gave them an opportunity to spread the message themselves. And so you started to see groups growing and using social media as an opportunity to recruit new parents. And they did this particularly on Facebook by using things like ads where they would run ads alleging that vaccines caused SIDS. They moved a little bit away from autism as you know, the kind of public zeitgeist um, came to you know, internalize that that was a false claim. So they instead claimed that vaccines caused crib death. Um, and that was a, this is a very real fear for parents. You know, there's a very real chance of SIDS and, and as a new mom, you know, I have three kids myself. This is the sort of thing that you think about when you have a baby. And so your desire to protect them, to keep them safe makes people very nervous and very receptive to these messages where they just think, okay, I'll just delay the vaccine, right? And, and this, this dynamic perpetuates itself as people join these groups, the groups get larger, they have more engagement. And then at the time, the Facebook recommendation engine pushed them out to more people. So even if you had never searched for a keyword related to vaccination, if you were a new parent with certain types of similarities to people who believed these things through what's called collaborative filtering, recommendation algorithms would promote that content to you. And so this through these, these sort of like inadvertent structural design things where the platform is just trying to engage users, this anti-vaccine content is pushed out to more and more people, some of whom join. And so it becomes a bit of like a flywheel. So it, it kind of perpetuates itself. And unfortunately, this is happening concurrently with a real loss of trust in institutions, a real loss of, of a sense of you know, communal American identity and the idea that we vaccinate for the broader community. It becomes very much uh, tied up in uh, a libertarian narrative kind of begins to emerge. Vaccination requirements for school are government tyranny. You shouldn't have to inject your children, even though you need a certain percentage of the population vaccinated even against something like measles for the vaccines to remain effective. And so this, all of this kind of <laughs> takes shape where you have the growth of these communities, the, the things that are happening online intersecting with the social dynamics and the kind of collapse of institutions that is happening offline. And it creates an environment where confusion and fear and not knowing what to trust all come together as people are looking for answers. This is oftentimes the community that they find. And that, infrastructure that you know would develop over a period of years as platforms recommended people into these groups uh, is what kind of forms the foundation of the anti-vaccine movement as it is when COVID hits. Yeah and th there is something I mean there, there's I think valid reasons for the decline of trust in institutions. Yes. Um, and I, I'm definitely part of that decline and you know, in the past year, more than a year, I guess we've been seeing really the the spectacular rise of the Substack um, info ecosystem. And you know, like if I think about in the last week, what I've learned the most about Omicron from, it's not you know, I, it's not the CDC or, or or the Atlantic or the New York Times, although those have been somewhat useful. It's it's like Eric Topol's Substack where he just breaks down all of the latest papers and in a digestible way. And, you know, that that's a person who obviously has credentials, but, uh, you know, to some degree he is, he is an, an influencer that is charismatic or persuasive, you know, and his, he's participating in, in propaganda in the broadest sense of the word. Uh, and, and there's there's going to be people like him that are that are peddling things that aren't true, or that are just less competent or, or less qualified or more dishonest. And uh, it's very difficult to know who to follow and uh, who, who to ignore. 
And, and another example I could give is on ivermectin. Like where I've learned the most about this is probably from Scott Alexander's post, or that, I guess that's that's his pseudonym, but the Astral Star Codex. Another one of these just great writers and um, sort of charismatic people with a following uh, who could be con men, but I, I would argue aren't. And and so I guess my, my question is, what what advice do you have for people trying to navigate this ecosystem where there are reasons to ha have less trust in mainstream institutions, but still want to get things right? <laughs> I, th I think that's actually one of the key questions of the time, right? Um, I... I like you um, was, you know, <laughs> I remember talking to the CDC um, back during one of the conspiracy theories alleging that the CDC was covering up um, evidence showing that uh, that measles vaccines caused autism in black boys specifically. It was very, very specific. And it was really intended to use race as a wedge to make the anti-vaccine movement less white, candidly. And so one of the things that it, that, that that did, you know, I remember talking to them about it and saying, and they chose not to respond, right? And this was a really interesting moment when there was this idea that what happened online was like just some people online who were talking, but there was still a belief that institutions would continue to hold this authority and this place in the American public conversation. And they had not yet realized the extent to which that was beginning to erode and that social media made the failures of institutions on on full display you know there's the the internet is forever meme but not only is the internet for is forever it's it's like really easily searchable <laughs> and and it's the kind of thing where you start to see these collages go up as the you know the mask collages you probably remember this um in the early days of the pandemic all of the media coverage that got it wrong. Um, all of the institutional commentary saying don't mask, whereas people on Twitter who, per your point, were not necessarily institutionally credentialed, but read the research and got it right. And those people were giving more accurate information. Meanwhile, the scientists were waiting until they had the sort of absolute truth. So there was a difference in time horizon here too. They were communicating in a much um, they, they were not responding to the kind of real time nature of how people try to make sense of things today. And so they were very slow to react and, and slow to put out information. So they really had still, you know, again, in 2015, it was this idea that it was just some conspiracy theorists on the internet and the internet wasn't real life versus, you know, now fast forward seven years to COVID. I think this question of how do you know what is worth paying attention to is actually the key question. That is the real thing that I think social media companies are struggling with right now, which is how do you, in that, again, everything is ranked somehow. So how do you curate good information? How do you do that without having a sense of what is true? Uh, because that is not a thing that they can necessarily be determining uh, in real time. I personally have tried to go the route of just following people across a vast swath of you know, different disciplines and, and political persuasions just to, to feel that I'm getting uh, as complete a picture as possible. Um, I, I, but at the same time, I mean, per your point, I am also there on social media. I've got three kids and the littlest one can't be vaccinated yet. And so there's a lot of questions that I have about uh, is, you know, how is this impacting babies? I, I, I don't have an answer for that yet. There is not a, there's a real decoupling between authority and institutional expertise, per your point, once someone amasses influence, they have an audience that they can reach. And so their opinion becomes something that people pay attention to, whether they have expertise when they opine on a topic or not. And that's a really interesting dynamic because your followers follow you because they like you and they trust you and they, you know, what you say resonates with them. And so I think this is where I don't know that influencers, I'd be actually curious to hear your take on this. Like, to what extent does the you know, do you recognize that power that you have at this point when you when you put content out? Is that is that on your mind? Also knowing that for many ways, the incentives for influencers, influencers is to kind of grow your clout, grow your audience, um, maximize revenue. And so there's an interesting incentive structure there that I think leads a lot of people down this um, like more firebrandy style than conveying information. And, you know, how, how should we think about what an influencer is today and what their responsibilities are to their audience. Yeah, that's, that's um, definitely a, a very important question and a relevant one to me. I mean, that I guess in terms of, you know, having 
quote unquote power. This is, it's an interesting thing. It's sort of like a frog boiling in water. There's no one point where you, the light comes on and you change from a normal person, normal guy, just saying what they think into person with power that should be held accountable for mistakes. But you have to recognize once, once that ha- once that has happened and, and take it seriously. And, um, you know, as far as, you know, being asked my opinion on things I don't know anything about, that was a problem, I think, before I got this podcast, when I was a writer that really specialized in talking about race. Um, sometimes I would get interviewed by people and they would just ask me something I know just enough about to say something about, but but not enough about to, to truly feel confident. And uh, there's enormous pressure to just to not say, oh, well, I don't know anything about that. Um, and, and what's more, I think an audience that gets to know you on your specialty, which, which would have been, you know, race in my case and, and misinformation and, and all the rest in your case. And uh, I mean, part of, part of it makes sense, which is that they've seen a lot of people say stuff about social media and mis- misinformation. And what you're saying has made the most sense or, or, or a lot more sense than everything else they hear. So they form the belief that you're a pretty good, you, you have a pretty good noggin on you. Like you're, 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 te- you're able to tell the bullshit from the real shit. And they form a, basically a character judgment about you and the assumption that that's probably a stable character trait when you're thinking even for the first time about another topic, you're bringing those same qualities to the table. And they're making the reverse character judgments about people that, you know, that they can tell no, no less than you are, are, are making less sense than you on, on your topic. So it makes sense that they would sort of value your opinion on other things. At the same time, not having paid attention to something means you're, you know less about it for, for everyone, no matter how good, uh, no matter how quick you are. Um, so, so I guess that's what I would say. And then I guess to the final point, this is, uh, yeah, the, the incentive and the, the problem of audience capture, I guess there's, there's two parts of it. One for me is that I intentionally do not pay attention at all to numbers. Like I, I can't tell you how many views my last video got. I can't tell you what, where, what my subscriber count, the trend it's been going on in the past six months. Um, I, I literally know nothing about this, but um, you know, I, I, have a, I have a manager who does. And if something drastic is happening or something that needs to come to my attention, then maybe he'll tell me. But other than that, I try to insulate myself as much as possible from numerical or financial feedback of, of how I'm doing. And I'm, I'm doing well enough that I can, I can, uh, support myself easily. So, um, and, and then, you know, there's this, the problem of, you know, audience response, you know, my audience catches me making mistakes sometimes, which is really important to me because I don't like making mistakes. I like to have as accurate a possible a view on any topic I care about, but I can't pay attention to all of it. Because uh, I, I basically have to distinguish the people that are making really true and valid criticisms of things I've said from from people that are are just upset that I'm not who they picture me being or, or something like that. And there's no there's no formula for that, but uh, it's something I'm pushing myself always to to be better at. But I, I think it, it is true there are a lot of content creators that have a much more, uh, you know, I, I, this is just going to sound like me patting myself on the back, but a less principled approach to, to how they engage with this and a more numbers hungry approach. And, and in certain places that doesn't really matter right? because it's entertainment uh, to begin with. But I, w- I would like to think that you know, with the kind of guests I get on here, that this is about something more than entertainment, and that I'm I'm um, I'm a servant of higher principles at the end of the day, 
so yeah, that's what I would say about it. I think the, you know, the influencer, right, as a, as a figure is such a novelty in our time. There was celebrity, right? But that was like kind of conferred from outside. Media had to decide to cover you, you know, however, whether that was tabloid media or, um, you know, mainstream media, whatever it was. But now you have the remarkable ability where like the the tools have been given to all of us and how we use them, I think, is is one of the most interesting. And what, what are the social norms that we're developing around this? Um, how do we react to, you know, how, how do we um, enjoy this proliferation of views, this diversity of opinions, this um, really authentic experience of another person's opinion and you one-on-one -on -one in conversation or uh, in, the, in the content they put out? Um, and how do we, uh, you know, how do, how do we think about that figure as this really pivotal, transformative, um, influential figure in shaping public opinion? I think that's one of the, one of the really unique uh, things that we are beginning to reckon with just over the last maybe four years. Yeah. All right. So I only have a little bit of time left with you, but I want to just completely hard pivot to a topic that I, I plan to get a, a, a guest that is specifically studies and knows a lot about this topic soon, um, probably very soon, but this is, a, and you're a former resident of the Bay Area, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, this is the, the, basically the the woke math curriculum that is now sweeping the state of California, but I think originates in San Francisco. I think, you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Again, with the um, <laughs> Renee's opinion as a mom. Um, oh man, I, I went to public school as a kid in New York and, um, and I think that many of us perhaps had this experience where there was like some differentiation. If you were good at math, maybe you went to like an extra math group, or if you were good at reading, you had a reading group and there were just, there was a recognition and this maybe was a function of resources. I honestly don't know to what extent it was a function of resources at the time, um, but there was a, a sense that we could help children who were further along and children who were further behind um, through this differentiation. When I got to San Francisco, um, you know, my my first son was born in 2013, so we are not near eighth grade. We're in second grade right now. But I thought it was really, you know, we, the curriculum had been changed such that all of the children had to take algebra together in ninth grade, and the decision had been made to eliminate eighth grade algebra, to eliminate access. So even if you were ahead, you could not choose to take it early because the course outcomes, particularly for black and brown students, were such that there was kind of a high failure rate and there was a theory that putting everybody into this class in ninth grade would improve the pass rate and would open access to, you know, to pathways to higher math. The problem was this created a situation where any child who wanted to take calculus um, AP calculus, which was a thing that many particularly STEM oriented students try to take before college, I did, you know. Um, and in order to get there, the students had to kind of double up or meaning they had to take two math classes in a year or something along those lines. So kids who wanted to did not have access anymore to the ability to, to take this. And that was the thing that I found so crazy. Uh, this idea that rather than recognizing that this that this evidence of failure in eighth grade, to me, suggested that the best place to put that attention would be earlier, right? Why are children failing in eighth grade? What can we learn about where they are in third grade? What can we learn about where they are in first grade? And, and then I discovered that uh, San Francisco didn't like assessment tests either, that there was this dynamic that assessment tests were problematic. So, you know, so as I started paying attention to the conversation around education, I was like, okay, so we, you know, we, we don't like the outcome, but we don't want to measure what's happening. So how the hell are, are we going to know like where where the problem is happening and and what the problem actually is? Is it the curriculum? Is it not relevant? What what are the ways in which we can use the abundance of resources and 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 you know thought at our disposal to think about how to solve this problem? Because it is a problem. Because we do want students of all backgrounds to be able to access advanced math and you know go on to STEM careers and so on and so forth. There's also an economic connotation there. I mean, I got to skip certain classes. I went to state school. I paid for it myself, 
And I got to skip calculus in college because I had taken it in high school. And so there's, a, there's so much tied up in this. And what wound up happening was that the city actually, Asian parents in particular were quite outraged about this. And the city started subsidizing summer math courses for students to take over the summer to, so that they could jump ahead in high school, which is crazy. It's like the city undermining the district's own policy rather than saying, maybe this policy isn't working. And fast forward a few years. So I, you know, I became kind of an eighth grade algebra zealot. It's a thing that I do opine about on Twitter, you know, <laughs> <laughs> again, <laughs> this is Renee's personal opinion. I, I think it's fucking ridiculous. Um, but the, so this, you know, this has like been a thing for me for a while. Um, all of a sudden the entire state of California is, starts thinking about adopting this curriculum, pointing to San Francisco as if it's some sort of success. What wound up happening was that there was kind of one year where the numbers appeared to show a higher pass rate in ninth grade when algebra was taken in ninth grade. But of course, there's a whole lot in there, which is there are kids who would have taken it in eighth grade who are now taking it in ninth grade. There's an opportunity cost. What do you not get to take when you're you know, kind of constrained in this way? There's a whole lot there. Um, but ultimately, parents actually started filing Freedom of Information Act requests from the city to try to get information about whether this was succeeding. And recently, uh, you know, kind of a committed community of parents and a few math teachers from the district put out this report saying that, in fact, these policies were not accomplishing the thing that they were uh, that they were intended to do, which was to give black and brown students access to these higher levels of math, that they, that they were not actually accomplishing that and that that was in the data. But nonetheless, the entire state was considering adopting this curriculum. So that's where the, that's where the conversation is. Um, I have left California, so I am, you know, <laughs> in solidarity on the sidelines with the, the parents who are just trying to, um, you know, to, to get this done. Like I said, I went to private school, uh, sorry, to public school. I send my kids to public school. I, I think that there's the, the idea that you have to put access to advanced math into private school, you have to make that a purview of private school children is outrageous. It's, it's fundamentally illiberal. It's, it's unprogressive, in fact, and it's just boggled the mind that, that this is where things went in California and that it was uh, that it was kind of marketed as like a new progressive approach to math and and so now the, uh, I think the last thing I heard, and I don't want to misstate the facts here, so you can fact check me on this, but um, was that they were kind of like halting the adoption for further public comment. Um, and I know that there's, uh, there's now this very um, kind of quaint like letter writing campaign. I don't know if you've seen this on Twitter, but um, it's, it's almost like being back in the days of like the correspondence wars, like this group has their letters with 500 signatories and this group has their letter with Nobel prize winners and Fields medalist winners. And each side is talking about their letters and trying to, uh, to advocate for their, um, for, their, for their vision for the math curriculum. But it really became, um, it really became quite a thing in, in California, uh, in San Francisco in particular, where you know, school board members alleged that parents who were advocating to bring back eighth grade algebra were like a bunch of racists. And I, it just really went away. Like the idea that that that, that was the thing that um, became a proxy for uh, for all of these different issues was uh, was kind of wild to me. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this is one of those areas where our, our uh, sort of national pathology of race really comes with a cost, which is that we can't, we can't discuss what really could be a very neutral, emotionally neutral kind of policy discussion. You know, I, in, in an alternate universe, there are people arguing about whether tracking makes sense from a purely educational point of view. And, yep. and you know, it's really something I, I could be open to either side of. I mean, but personally, I, I my my lived experience would would probably favor tracking because I was a, a you know bright at math as a kid, and the the second I moved from public to private school, where I was now in a very tracked environment, um, it ended up being being just amazing for me because I, I wasn't challenged before that. And I, I actually, this is like the cheesiest thing ever, but I remember at the end of sixth grade, when I had just moved from public to private school, my, at the end of my first year of, of private school, I remember being so moved by the experience of feeling intellectually challenged 
that I wrote a poem. I like, I spontaneously wrote a poem about how much I loved it. Right. And so, so my, my lived experience would probably favor that, but I'm also very open to, to, you know, to it being shown that some, somehow the, the, the classroom environment is better uh, for, for kids that are struggling if they're around uh, the kids that aren't. I mean, this is, it's, it's not impossible. It's kind of, it's plausible and it's, it's something the data should weigh in on. But the idea that you short circuit the whole conversation by saying you're a racist, if you think, if, if you believe in tracking, which is, I mean, like, this is the kind of stuff that you're going to hear from Nicole Hannah Jones and very prominent, influential people that, that, uh, you know, elites that send signals this way. Um, it's, it, I think it's a shame that, that the conversation has been so soiled by that uh, and that that's now perhaps expanding. I think there's a lot of entrenchment in which we are not spending very much time considering the evidence, right? And, and this is again, um, one of these areas per your point, I would, I, I also am completely open to changing my mind on these issues. I think that that is where we have to be. I think some of the, you know, there's a lot of um, really strong evidence that for many, many years, admission to gifted schools, for example, was largely the purview of white kids because their parents advocated for it, right? Um, they signed them up to take certain tests. They you know, gave them particular types of tutoring, et cetera, et cetera. And that I think is a systemic inequity that led to particular you know, demographics having a, you know, kind of a, um, a prevalence there that came from the advocacy almost, you more of like the parent advocacy. I've seen some approaches where what the district will test the entire student body. That's actually the district that we're in now. That's what they do. They, the, every single kid in the school takes this test called the NNAT3 and they take it in class. Um, and then the other thing is the teachers themselves can advocate for students who perhaps don't test well. It's kind of a weird test. It's like kind of pattern matching and analogies. And it doesn't, it doesn't involve reading or math, actually. It's, it's just a, a, a different type of test. Um, the teachers, though, can also kind of nominate kids in saying, you know, in my classroom, I experience like, per your point, this particular student is extraordinary at poetry. This particular student is, uh, you know, gifted in this other way. What are the ways in which we can surface and develop and help those kids to continue along, to, per your point, to challenge them? Um, you know, I was, I was, you know, <laughs> speaking of being moved, we moved districts, you know, so a, a school counselor called me and said, you know, your son's been in school for two weeks. We want to just tell you how he's like settling in. He knew nobody. He goes all of a sudden to this new school, new state, you know, right into second grade. Um, you know, and, and she gave me this very kind of blunt assessment of here is the, the various like experiences he was having. And she said, you know, we do assessment tests here. And so your son's going to be taking the following assessments. And I thought, my God, they're just so matter of fact about it. It's not fraught. It's just a, we want to know where kids are, particularly since in the course of a pandemic in which kids have been out of school since March, 2020, we want to know where kids are. In San Francisco, our school board came up with, it's not learning loss, it's learning change. And I was like, the fuck, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it sure as hell is learning loss if a kid is is you know doesn't have parents at home to homeschool them for that year and a half and they're getting 60 minutes a day of virtual first grade there is absolutely learning loss and this is where i think the the education conversation i don't think we've seen we've reckoned with what is going to happen as a result of the pandemic the inequities perpetuated during the pandemic because moms you know like me i, I had a full-time job but and three kids but i could spend money for my son to take virtual things just so that I could keep working and he could keep being educated. Not everyone has the means to do that. The idea that we shouldn't assess children, that the assessment tests are the problem is absolutely backwards. And, and I don't understand how that has come to be described as progressive. It's just the weirdest thing to me. And I, and I think it is actually deeply toxic. Again, this is my opinion as like a mom of three with my lived experience. <laughs> but when the school called me and was just like, yeah, he's doing well in this, you know, he's a little bit behind in this, and this is where they're going to be taking assessments. I thought like, God, this isn't politicized. What a novelty. Yeah, I just had Emily Olster on my podcast and we were talking a little. She, she pays very close attention and I think was involved in creating a database of 
um, school closure and, and, and the rest. And we were just talking about this point, this like the, to get rid of school, even temporarily is to amplify the difference between the haves and the have nots. You know, it's, it's, if you have supportive parents, stable family, um, educated parents, there, there are probably some kids that almost learn more at home because they have, you know, their, their parents are professors or, or, or whatever it is. And then there are kids that where home is just chaos, you know, and, um, and school was, it was like a haven away from home, you know, where you, yeah. you got lunch and that even that was like important. So that, that was the one thing I think the district did well was ensure that things like the, the meal, um, you know, the, the basic living services. I think it's a tragedy that, that meals are tied to schools. That's a whole other story though. But, mm-hmm. but this, um, this question of how do we ensure that basic needs are met for children is one level of the conversation. And then this, this question of um, how do we reckon with what's just happened for the last year and a half and, and think about what, you know, what are the paths forward? What are the paths by which uh, we can help the, you know, the, the students who are most disadvantaged um, in that period to move forward? I think that's a, uh, you know, that, that is, I think, one of the most important conversations that we're going to be having as a country over the next year and a half. All right. Well, on that note, I'm going to let you go, Renee. This has been a really great conversation. I hope we can do this again. Um, but before you leave, can you just point my audience in the direction of your website and or Twitter handle? Yeah, my website's ReneeDeresta.com, and I am like years out of date on updating it. Um, my Twitter handle's at NoUpside, uh, N-O-U-P-S-I-D-E. It's kind of an old finance joke. Nice. Thanks, Renee. Thanks. If you appreciate the work I do, the best ways to support me are to subscribe directly through my website, ColemanHughes.org, and to subscribe to my YouTube channel so you'll never miss my new content. As always, thanks for your support.